Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Bob. I'm an alcoholic. Sober through the grace of God and age. It's the 10th of December, 1967. For that, I'm very grateful. Uh, someone said it's really tough following Katie. I, I don't think I will. I think I'll just join. I, uh, uh, I love these Woodstocks. There's something that happens, you know, I get stimulated in, in different ways. If I don't compare myself, I have a tendency, you know, that I have to do it like Katie does it or Peter does it or, uh, it is also individual, along with having a primary text, along with having 12 spiritual principles, along with having a very long experience that we have in the program. Each of us brings ourselves to that process. And uh, I'm going to talk today about step six and seven. Uh, I want to thank Mark uh, and Don, who I <laughs> suspect was heavily involved in the way. This is this is really a uh, risk, but what a wonderful thing that we're able to experience because someone stepped up. I've been involved in, you know, and I don't know why, you know, there, you always hear a little skinnier gossip about why people thought it wasn't going to work here. I, this is really cool, very cool. Thank you for including me. Someone would have told me 46 years ago that I'd be in New York City at an AA conference speaking as opposed to... <laughs> I, I, I sometimes don't get what a complete privilege and change that it is. My wife and I are thrilled to be here. Yes, we had a great day. Tom and Cheryl, well, mostly Cheryl, has been a great host. I... Uh, uh, but they allowed Linda and I to have a morning lunch together, so we had kind of walked down memory lane and did a little shopping and went to her favorite restaurant for lunch, and it was just cool. We had a great dinner Friday night with Tom and Cheryl and Charlie and Katie, so it was cool. And I'm here with people that I love and respect. It's uh, I feel like I'm, I, I, I like being with you. I like joining this process. So I'm going to talk about... Uh, I started drinking when I was 13, 14 years old. Uh, liked it from the beginning. I was an insecure kid. I entered high school at 4 foot 11, 95 pounds. You know, you kind of try to compensate for that as you go through. You're pretty insecure. Went to a military academy and a high school and a college campus. Uh, we drank a lot in high school. We had fraternities. Our parents were those Second World War heroes that came back and made life look pretty easy and drank hard, played hard, and worked hard. I was. Lived in a Catholic ghetto. If you had less than seven children, you had a reproduction problem. <laughs> and there were, I just went to a funeral of a, my next door neighbor. And we were each other's lower companions. We were the sneaky bad boys. And, uh, I quit drinking when I was 23 and he, 24, and he kept on. He had got Korsakoff syndrome and died of, he died eight days ago. And I went and visited him in the hospice. Brought back a lot of bad memories of what a sneaky little crap head I was and uh, how we shared that experience. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, I drank my brains out as a young guy. Got into a lot of trouble. I was the guy who made the false ID cards. I got into a lot of trouble. I thought my trouble was I was underage. Uh, I, we were cop, we were copying our parents. I mean, we had cocktail parties and we stole their booze and, and, and went on, did it. had a chance to go away to school, thought I'd get away from my parents, thought I'd get away from the cops, went to school, thought my life would change. It got worse. I was, uh, you know, I, my mother sent me to school early, so I was 13 in high school and I was 17, I guess, in college. And I was unprepared for it. I was sophisticated, but I was pathologically immature. So I get down to school, and now I'm the school drunk. I mean, they use my room as a study hall. I started out as an A student. 
I walk out of the University of Notre Dame, middle of my senior year, in the yearbook, with my class ring, walk out, never finish. And uh, I'm due to be commissioned. I lose my commission. The Army lets me out with a uh, diagnosis of alcoholism. I was diagnosed an alcoholic at 19. I thought that was goofy. I, I just, uh, goofy. I mean, I just couldn't. You know, I went. To, I remember going to a library, getting a book on alcoholism, and it was a Freudian-based book that related alcoholism to latent homosexuality. And uh, as much as I couldn't even deal with the one issue, the combination was deadly. It was <laughs> a little, a little more that I wanted to examine. And, uh, <laughs> I remember I went to the psychiatrist. That was the first question she asked me when I went in her room. Now, I don't know why you'd ask that of, a, of me, but that was the first question she had. So uh, I leave school, show up back at home, finish school at a local university. When I finished school, my dad asked me to leave home. He said, we love you, but we just flat ass don't know what to do with you. And uh, so I left home, got a job at a liquor store. <laughs> so I... <laughs> have to use your gifts. I had, so it's my last year of drinking. And I'm drinking a fifth, four or five days a week. Worked as a waiter for six months, got in a fight, got, no, no, sorry. Worked at the liquor store for six months, got in trouble, got fired. Worked as a waiter for six months. And I'm living not quite on Skid Row, but pretty close. I'm checked up with people that I live with and worked with. And uh, went to a party one night, got my face kicked in got fired, and I was tapped. I had no place to go, and I went back to my family and asked if I could move back in the house. They allowed me to move back in the house. They asked me not to drink. I was unable not to drink. I started to fall apart when I quit, so I drank my way through that process. When I moved back in the house, I really tried to change my life. I was as unhappy with being the family jerk as they were unhappy having me be the family jerk. I'm one of seven kids, number two in the line. Love my brothers and sisters, love my parents. My dad was my hero. And uh, when I moved back in the house, I got back together with Linda, who I'd gone with for, we can't remember anymore, a year and a half. Broke up with her for almost a year. Called her about once a month like a low-grade headache just so she couldn't get anything else going. <laughs> and uh, and uh, <sighs> and I went back and asked her, we were pretty serious before we broke up, and I went back and asked if we could get together with the idea of looking at marriage, and uh, she allowed that. She was a psychiatric nurse working on an alcohol ward at the time, uh, so while she's attractive, she's <laughs> not very bright, and uh, <laughs> we had... why they are attracted to us is such a mystery. God. And uh, she's a 47-year member of Al-Anon. And, uh, uh, she's got a great program, and we have, it's been a great, a great ride all the way through. Um, and I got a job as an executive trainee, bought my first car, thought I'm finally going to be a grown-up. All I wanted to do was be a grown-up. Everybody who was a grown-up looked like they had it together, only I could not quit drinking. never occurred to me if I really wanted to quit drinking, I couldn't quit drinking. So I get a job with this manufacturing, or yeah, now I'm in, in the engineering department. I'm the company drunk. I mean, I use my sick leave up in the first couple of months. I'm falling asleep at my desk. I'm, you know, I mean, they want you to stay at lunch. They have lunch hours. They want you in on Mondays, stay on Fridays, and I am... I am in serious trouble. Quit that job after six months. When I went back to make amends with that boss, he said, God, you interviewed so well. I said, yeah, we do. Um, <laughs> we're looking for an entity that would give rewards for in 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 interviewing. And uh, then I took a job as a salesperson. I had the job about four months, and a buddy of ours got married. I went out on a four-day drunk, and I woke up. That was my moment of truth. I had plenty of mom moments, but I woke up. On Thursday, hugging the toilet, doing my morning exercises, looked at myself in the mirror, didn't know if I had a job, didn't know if I had a fiancé, didn't know if I could continue to live at home until I was married. And I called AA. All of a sudden that day, that didn't seem like such an impossible idea, and two guys came out and made a 12-step call on me at a cafe. One guy had six years, one guy had six months. 
They sat me down in the booth. He said, we're from Alcoholics Anonymous. We had a drinking problem. We found an answer for it. We'd like to share it with you. If it helps you, that's great. If it doesn't help you, don't worry about it. For some reason, talking to guys like you helps us. And they told me their story. Now, I had been in front of every kind of help you could possibly get. Doctors, lawyers, Indians, bishop, priests, nuns, psychologists, proctologists. I have run the, <laughs> the whole spectrum of help that any reasonably well-off family could provide. And uh, I'd never been in front of another person who had a drinking problem. In a 45-minute period of time, those two men changed my life. We have many traditions in Alcoholics Anonymous. The most important is that we share our experience, strength, and hope, not our belief, not our philosophy, not our doctrine. Those men changed my life by sharing their drinking history with me. That night, I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I met my sponsor at my first meeting. And... uh, I drank twice after coming to AA, once on a business trip after 30 days of sobriety. I didn't go to AA. I was in Santa Monica. I mean, of all the places I could have, you know, went back. I drank, came back, got three months sobriety, and drank on our honeymoon. Had my last drink on the airplane on the way back in December of 1967. My sponsor sat me. My sponsor's name was Warren McGinley. He passed away three, three years ago. And uh, he was my sponsor for 43 years. We had 100 years of sobriety between us. He was the 12-step champion of the Uptown Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. He did more 12-step work. He was a mailman. He was a powerful, ordinary man who probably changed the course of 200 people's lives in his AA career. And uh, his wife was Linda's sponsor, and we were privileged to... Be part of that right now. My sponsor is a guy by the name of Dick M. in Omaha, Nebraska, or Bellevue, Nebraska. My sponsor sat me down in a chair and said, "Alcoholism is a disease, physical, mental, and spiritual. Once you cross the line from problem drinking into alcoholism, your alcoholism affects you all the time when you're drinking and when you're not drinking." The idea that my alcoholism could affect me when I was not drinking was a very new idea. I had never, in all the help by God, I had never had anybody give me the idea that my alcoholism was active when I was not drinking. I pretty much just heard I had a drinking problem. He said, what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, once we take our last drink or drug, is we use the 12 steps to change, to find a different way to live than the way we live before, so we don't have to go back to drugs or booze to do something for us that we're unwilling or unable to do for ourselves. If you don't change, you will not stay. He said, have you ever quit? I said, yeah. He said, did it work? I said, no. He said, it didn't work for me either. There's a difference between sobriety and abstinence, and that's the program. And that's what we do in alcohol. That was like the Gettysburg Address of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to be his, I got to be his wingman. I got to go on those 12 step calls. I got very, very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, when I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a wall built up around me. So you couldn't see what I didn't want you to see what was going on in my life. Thinking what went on, you like me, but you only like what I let you see about me. If you could see everything about me, you'd hate me. I hate me. Who knows more what a lousy, crummy, insufficient person I am than me. I'm walking around comparing my insides with your outsides. At some point in time, I got sick enough or afraid enough or tired enough or hurt enough that I started to tear that wall down, and I said, hey, come and get me. I don't care who you are, where you come from. Just come and get me and help me not be who I am anymore. I can't stand me five more minutes. For the first time in my life, I started to tear the wall down. Started when I called AA, continued when I, you know, when I joined Alcoholics Anonymous and culminated when I did my fifth step and I made a discovery. Tore the wall all the way down. I'm not unique. My personality may be unique, but not my illness, not my behavior, not my feelings, not my experience. And I started to have a sense of hope that what worked for you could work for me. Big change. Most of us, Clancy talks, Clancy has about a half a dozen things that I think are unique to him. He talks about, you know, the disease perception, but my case is different. And each of us walks in here with a profound sense of uniqueness. If that doesn't get reduced, you look for the differences rather than the similarity. Most of us have some sort of ego collapse when that wall comes down and you start your, you start to identify. And that's what happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, was a very active member from the very first time I came in Alcoholics Anonymous. My gift is I loved AA since the moment I walked in the front door. It's been hard for me to do the work, but it has not been hard for me to stay. This has been my place. I have no other place to go. 
those men and women, there were two women, <laughs> Rose and Helen, <laughs> but the meetings I went to, my, my two home groups, uh, there were mostly about 35 men, mostly 50 years of age, talking to this punk, 23-year-old, 24-year-old, Second World War vets with the same issues and problems and feelings that I had. It was just one of the most profound experiences. They welcomed me. They got me involved. I learned very quickly that AA wasn't about just abstinence. I'm staying, you know, I'm going early, I'm staying late, and I'm listening to the conversations they're having, and they're having conversations about fights with their wife, amends. I mean, they're not having problems at work. They're not having, they're talking about life. They're not just talking about how not to drink. So, and in Minnesota, 95% of our meetings were closed step discussion meetings. It's all we did was we'd come in and you'd do the fifth step or whatever step we were on for five minutes. We'd break up into two groups and today, you know, and then we'd finish the meeting and we'd discuss. So we stayed with the program and stayed with the steps was the basis of our recovery discussion. So I said, okay, I'll buy it. I'm an alcoholic. If I'm an alcoholic and AA's got the answer, I've got a half a dozen other things that are going on in my life that are tearing my life apart. And if AA works, those ought to be taken away from me, right? And it might take a year. <laughs> it might take 50 from what I can tell. It's amazing. Gary's going to have 50 years in December. That's a really something. Uh... So I got very involved. I went through the steps, and uh, I had different areas of unmanageability in my life. I spent more money than I made, which you end up in debt if you continue that. I had trouble getting up in the morning. I had trouble getting to work. I had trouble staying at work, and I had trouble working at work. Other than that, I was a pretty good worker. <laughs> We started to have children, as my children got older, I was loud, impatient, angry, and sometimes violent with my children. Had a gambling problem, more of a hobby, uh, <laughs> four or five hours a day, four or five days a week. It wasn't a big deal, and I'm, but I'm making five grand a year playing backgammon, and it's kind of like a second job. I've always kind of supported myself by gambling. It was just, you know, I did it all the way through college, and now I'm doing it in, my, in sobriety. I had every one of those problems when I did my first, fourth, and fifth step, and none of those issues made my first, fourth, and fifth step. My first, fourth, and fifth step was a recitation of the worst things that I had done, the, the guilty things, the things that separated me, that made me different. I did not get to the causes and conditions. I did the best job I did. I wouldn't go back and redo it. I had a chance. I've since taken 15 or 16 or 20 fourth and fifth steps. But th my first, fourth, and fifth step did not get to the causes and conditions. Uh, I didn't have a very good sense of my defects of character during my first year of sobriety. During my second year is kind of where I got them handed to me. One by one, the issues that I, the gambling, the money spending, the angry, the pornography, the, you know, the poor husbanding, you know, the work issues, one by one, those started to come and land on my plate. And one by one, I started to take them on and I tried to deal with them. And I had, you know what I thought recovery was? I thought recovery was the absence of problems. Now, I'm, I'm kind of an idealist, but I did. I thought if you had a good program, you didn't have any problems. <laughs> now, I'm at my sponsor's house two or three days a week. He's a very human guy. It isn't like I don't know, but for, there was some reason that I'm harder on myself than I am on others. I so admired and loved these guys and gals that I was in the group with. I didn't see their issues like I saw my issues. I saw mine from the inside. And one by one, I'm taking these things on, and it's kind of like, you get me sober, I'll learn how to be a husband. You get me sober, I'll learn how to work. You get me sober, I'll do this, I'll do that. And one by one, I get taking these things on, and I'm making very little progress. I'm on the down escalator going up. They started to bother, you know, second year, I really get a pretty good list. Third and fourth year, they start to bother me. Fifth and sixth year, they're eating my lunch, and I'm seven years sober. My pants are in fire, and I'm in trouble. And I'm going to talk more about that. But I'm going to say right now, I think that's normal. I used to, I was so ashamed because I'm a great starter, never finish anything. And I thought this is just what you're doing. You're just repeating this pattern in AA. 
For the first two years, I was one of the youngest guys in the group. They're patting me on the head, telling me what a great guy, I'm, what a great job I'm doing. I got all the merit badges. I'm sponsoring people. I'm giving talks. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And uh, uh, but I'm dying on the inside. And I'm, it's it's kind of like you know when you start drink, one of the great questions when you first start drinking when people say you're alcoholic is when did you start lying about your use early. You know, from the beginning, I started lying. Well, now I'm an AA, and brick by brick, don't worry about that. I'll get them. So now I'm an AA, sober, going to seven meetings, you know, seven meetings a week, sponsoring guys, giving talks. And brick by brick, I build the damn wall back up, sober and alcoholics anonymous. Thank you very much for having my drinking problem. Stay out of my sex life. Stay out of my marriage. Stay out of my parenting. Stay out of my work. Stay out of my finances, brick by brick, sober, sponsored. I'm telling my sponsor 65% of what's going on. I know in New York you do 100%. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's great. Shit, you only tell yourself 65%. <laughs> Life is lived forward, but it's understood backwards. You don't see it until you're through it. I did not get it when I was going through it. I was sleepwalking through my own life. And uh, I'm seven or eight years sober, seven and a half, I guess, about the time of the International, Linda's dad dying, we have, we have to cancel Denver, and, and uh, I'm in trouble. I'm in as much debt as I was when I walked in the front door of Alcoholics Anonymous after paying off all the bills, and uh, every area of my life is in trouble. And uh, I'm scared. I'm thinking about suicide. I'm not thinking about drinking. You know, it is. I'm just. This is too much for me. And uh, I've gone through the steps twice. I don't seem to get the relief that I think I'm supposed to get. And I'm in serious trouble. The two things that have saved my butt in Alcoholics Anonymous is I love the old timers, so I had plenty good examples and plenty of teachers and good people to talk to. Second thing was I can't keep my mouth shut, so I am talking about some of the stuff that's going on in my life. But it's kind of surfacy. And uh, I knew what the problem was. The problem was to find out what God had to do with Wednesday. I'm busting my ass trying to get my life straightened out, and my life's not straightened out. And uh, the problem I had is you go to God and you ask God for help. Who's there? God is Bob. What do you want? <laughs> what do I want? My pants are on fire. I need help. Will you help? God says, yeah. Then I ask God, what do I do? Now, you have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what God's going to tell a guy with my list of defects of character what to do. Get up in the morning. Go to work. Stay at work. Work at work. <laughs> yeah. I know you don't have that problem in New York, but it's, it's a, kind of a Midwest thing. You know, get on a budget. I think that's an al on word. It's not in the book. It's a... Uh, Tough word. Be kind and loving to your wife. Be gentle with your children. And stop gambling. I'm going to say, hell, if I knew how to do all those things, I wouldn't need God. What the hell you think I've been, you know, <laughs> the hell you think I've been trying to do for the last seven years, eight years? And uh, I was stuck in that place for almost two years. So what's the, what's the use of going to develop a relationship with your higher power if you can't fulfill the conditions of the relationship? As soon as I clean my act up. As soon as I start making some significant progress on what's going on, that's when I'm going to deepen my relationship with the God and my understanding. But until then, I just don't see the efficacy of doing that. I'm stuck. Out of fear, I went back to the steps for the third time. Powerless and unmanageable? <laughs> Hell yes. What I discovered as I lost the second step, I believe that for us, but not for me, because I'm eight years sober and I'm in trouble. And I had it when you're in pain, you start to do more work. I started to see people with bigger problems than I had with smiles on their faces walking through the walls that I was trying to avoid. And I came to believe again that God would restore Bob to sanity. Took the third step on my knees with my sponsor. Did a fourth step. Best fourth step I've ever taken. Did a fifth step with my sponsor. First two I did with clergy. This one I did with, I said, be careful. When I'm done, I'm going to do whatever you recommend. I said, I feel like I'm dying of thirst light next to a lake. I am so goddamn tired of the problems I'm having. If you came to my house with my problems, I could tell you what to do. I just can't or won't do it. 
and I am burnt out on can't and won't. Did the fifth step. Uh, one of the things he wanted me to do was go to a psychologist. You got a lot. Of, you got a lot of issues about work, money, failure, and success. I want you to go to a psychologist. I want you to have conversations about that. I want you to bring those conversations back to me, and we will sort them out in the AA manner. And I did that. The psychologist wanted my wife involved. I did not want my wife involved. God, the conversation's always different when your spouse is in the room. I mean, it just. <laughs> The data is, there's just a different data bank available <laughs> when your spouse is in the room. <laughs> and then he wanted our kids involved, and I was ashamed of how I was with the kids, and I did not want to, but we did, we went through it. I don't have the time to go into it. What I discovered in the meeting with that man was fear. Remember he said to me, why are you, so, I'm telling him my business is going broke, I'm busting my ass two or three hours a day. And... Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. I, just, I'm glad you think that's funny. And uh, the, uh, you know. he said, why are you so afraid of failing? I wanted to punch him. And uh, what I discovered was fear. I'm swimming in fear. I'm afraid of being a husband. I'm afraid of being a father. I'm afraid of work. I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of success, which I later found out. And uh, not too long after that fateful meeting with that guy, I mean, it was like the seventh or eighth meeting with that man. I'm in my living room after a particularly hor horrible day. Went to work late, left early, got in the back end of the game. I won $700. I missed dinner. I missed the AA meeting. I came home. I got a fight with my wife and slapped one of the kids. One of those you like to have videotaped and sent to the general service office to show what eight years can do. And I said, gee, it happened again. I said, it happened again. Weren't you there? You know? Yeah, I was there. But it's so habitual. I don't even have to think about this. I fall into these patterns like I'm in a blackout. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a bunch of crap. My life was the way it was because I designed it that way. I wanted to gamble whenever the hell I wanted to gamble for as much money as I wanted to gamble and not have problems because of gambling. I wanted money without work. I wanted my wife's and children's love and affection without spending time with them. Not a very good design. And all of a sudden I realized that I had tried as hard as I knew how to try to clean my act up and I had failed. And I was given the opportunity to take the sixth and the seventh step at a level that I had not taken them before. The sixth step said we're entirely ready to have God remove our defects of character. The seventh step said we humbly ask and remove our shortcomings. I had spent eight years trying to, with your help, trying to get rid of my defects of character. I do not have the power. I have the responsibility, but it happens through me, not by me. I'm the pipe, not the well. A doctor doesn't heal. He creates a septic environment, creates an atmosphere where the healing can take place, and God heals. Farmer doesn't grow. He plants a seed, creates a fertile environment. The growth can take place, and God grows. And we don't change. We create an atmosphere in which change can take place, and God changes us. Honest, open-minded, willing. Six in the seventh step. And that night, five of the major problems, four of the major problems of my life disappeared, such as the power of the six in the seventh step and the power of God in the AA program. I quit gambling that night. Now, I had to put a structure in to support that change. I gave the checkbook to my wife. My wife happens to be a spouse who can manage money. Not all spouses can. She could. Gave her the checkbook. I went on an allowance. She still puts a $100 bill on my bed stand once a week. That's kind of, I like, it's kind of a <laughs> good feeling. <laughs> Actually, recently she went up to 140 so I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a, I made appointments with my sponsor about when I'd go to work, how long I'd stay at work, and what I would try to do at work. I spent thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours trying to learn how to be a better parent. I think having children is one of the most demanding, wonderful experiences, but I think it's like having a bowling alley installed in your head. I mean, it's a great privilege, but it is. Take 125% of whatever you got. And my life started to change. It got much better. My business career took off and all that sort of stuff. If you ask many of us what our greatest gift in our lives were, I think most of us, many of us in this room would say Alcoholics Anonymous. I just, you know, it gave me my life back. I'll tell you something. One of the greatest events in, in, in our lives 
was not our recovery, it was our collapse. And it wasn't just like hitting bottom, it was like hitting bottom and having a trap door open. We talk about when I surrendered. I think it's more accurately to say when I was surrendered. Most of the important, dramatic, fundamental changes in our lives do not happen by us, they happen through us. I'm a Catholic. I've been going to parochial school. I've always had a pretty good sense of values and ethics. I've always wanted to be a pretty good man. Tried like hell with varied success. Many of us come up here and we talk about the problems we have in sobriety. You never used to hear that talk. When I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, the talks were a drunk lug. Talks started with the first drink, ended with their last drink, and they spent five minutes at the end of the talk talking about wives, kids, and jobs. Included in those wonderful talks was recovery if you could hear the music. These were powerful men and women, and you knew that something very dramatic happened to them to alter their lives. Chamberlain probably almost single-handedly started to change the communication in Alcoholics Anonymous and started to talk more about recovery, the program, and the steps. Cecil MacCheater, other people did that, but almost single-handedly Chuck changed the oral communication in Alcoholics Anonymous. Today, because we have so much sobriety, because we have people coming in early, people are out in the audience saying, then what? <laughs> you know, you got sober, then what? So today, in our communication, as you hear from this week, and we talk a little bit more about life and sobriety. So when Mike talked about allowing those things, you know, having a God that didn't judge him, didn't separate him, was not angry, you have to allow yourself to have what you have. Katie is talking about inventory. I mean, how do you, you know, it's see it or be it. If you don't see it, you are it. It wasn't until you saw your alcoholism you could do anything about it. See it or be it. It owns you if you don't see it. Ladies on the, you know, lady goes to the doctor. She says, I got a problem. Doctor says, what's wrong? She says, well, I'm passing gas. You can't hear it and you can't smell it, but I have this horrible sensation. I wish you'd give me something for it. Doctor gives us some medicine, come back in a week. Doctor says, how is it now? She says, it's worse. He says, what do you mean? She says, well, now you can smell it. He said, good, now that we have your nose cleared up, we can work on your hearing. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, okay. There is, okay. I promise you the people around us have been smelling and hearing it for a long, long time. Okay. So if you've been around AA for a while, as Bill had been, I don't know if I, I want to read something, because I, I really think unless you allow yourself to uh, have the problems you have, nineteen fifty one, a guy by the name of Mel Barker wrote a letter to Bill Wilson. And uh so this is a guy with two years of sobriety writing Bill Wilson, asking him about his spiritual experience, and uh, wondering about how his life's going. And Bill... Oh, crap. Well, Bill says two, th- two things about it. He, so he's asking him about his spiritual experience. He said, I fail to make the point to every AA who has been in the program gets the same thing. The only difference is that I had the most experience that has strung out over a long period of time in sudden events. I think the ego gives way at depths in those sudden, in those complete collapses, at least momentarily. This permits a huge inrush of grace and brings a vision. In most cases, grace leaks in a little by little. Therefore, I can't hold them with most theologians that these sudden experiences are something very special and unique. If you were to take the sum of your own transformation since you have been in AA and condense the whole business into six minutes, you too would see the stars and more. Uh, he goes on to say later that he just been into about an eight-year depression. 
that he doesn't believe that, you know. He said, even at my worst, he said, on further point, with me, the original experience was so prodigious that that the preview of destiny was so intense, I have never had any difficulty with doubts since that time. At my worst, and that has been often, Lee, damn bad. I sense the presence of God, and he has never deserted me. Long ago, I became a pupil of AA. All around me, people were doing better with themselves in a spiritual sense than I ever could. This is Bill Wilson talking to a guy with two years of sobriety. In my role as Mr. AA, I have been enabled to manage fairly well. But as one neurotic drunk talk, trying to get along and grow, I often have been pathetically rebellious. Practically all the sins I didn't have time for when I was drinking, I've fallen for since in the last 12 years. Despite all my blessings and opportunities, I spent eight years in depression, sometimes very severe ones. And he goes on to talk about how the advantage, what he did is he got off the road and he was able to write the 12 and 12 and design the general service structure. So he said maybe it wasn't all that bad. He goes on to talk about how Dr. Bob was more grounded spiritually than he was. And he just kind of ends it and says, this is my report. This is the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous talking to a new guy, writing him a letter. We talk about Bill's ego. I think Bill had a level of humility that was astounding. Every time the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous asked something of him, he said yes, every time. So first of all, in my life, I have to allow myself the truth that I have failed. I have to allow myself. So we know we're powerless over our disease, but do we know we're powerless over our lives? Do we know that we're, you know, you come in here and you've got a six-foot ball of dirt that you've dragged through the junkyard of life, and you show up in AA with this thing, and then they start power washing it and reducing it, and you find out somewhere in the middle of there, there's something that looks pretty sexy, and it's this beautiful thing, and it's got jewels on it and everything like that, and you find out it looks like a lamp. Two years later, you get a cord. A year after that, you plug it in. A little while later, someone gets you a bulb. <laughs> later, you turn the bulb on. Quite a bit later, you find out it's a three-way bulb. (laughs) Now, would you diminish the lamp for not having power? Like we diminish ourselves for lack of power? We're designed not to have the power. We're designed to be in relationship with the power greater than ourselves. That's our design. We are not designed to know. We are designed to be in contact with our source. At our core, we are God. We aren't everything God is, but everything we are is God. The powerfulness of the program. So we've talked about, Carl so aptly talked about our powerlessness. And then Mike talked about forgiveness and his experience with inventory. And Peter talked about that powerful decision. And today we just go, the word decision doesn't seem to have the power that it seemed to have you know, if you want to come over to the house and make tell your story or make a decision, I mean, it was a big deal. It was not a, a small deal. Today, I think we that word doesn't quite have the the depth that it used to have. And uh, then Katie so wonderfully went through the inventory process. So we've we've had our collapse, and in the collapse, what happens in the collapse? The ego gets ground to dust. When the ego is down, there's an opening. So. Katie talked about being broken or Peter or someone. But we're broken open. That's where the light comes in. Who's that singer that talks about when you're broken, that's where the light comes in? Yeah. You have to, Cohen. Or I mean, you have to. All of us have to be broken. Otherwise, we're eggs. There is no entry point. We are designed to be broken open. We have to die to get the message. In that place... We're united. In that place, we're like one. Okay. I mean, you're sitting in an AA meeting. You're sitting in this room. You're listening to the speakers talk. And all of a sudden, something someone says is powerful, and it's meant just for you. And your soul goes, oh, yeah. It doesn't go, isn't that interesting? I think I'll write that down. Oh, I like that. Isn't that cute? It just goes, oh, yeah. 
Who's doing the, oh yeah? You're nowhere. You don't think it's tr true. You know it's so. You just know. And we regularly in meetings and regularly with our sponsors and regularly when we read the, the book. Why is the book so powerful? The most dynamic spiritual books in the world, when you read them, you have an experience. You don't get information. If you're really present when you're reading it, you have an experience when you read it, and it alters you in the reading. My biggest, I have two biggest obstacles in living my life as well as I would like to live it. One of them is that I'm afraid of God. If I really turn my will and my life over to the care of God, what, you know, I mean, in the old days, it was kind of like being a, being a missionary and sent to China. I mean, if I, open, if I open the whole deal up. But if the process of finding God is the process of coming home, if the process of finding God is becoming who you have always been, it is removing what is in the way, the process of finding God is not a process of addition, it's a process of subtraction. And what you discover is what's always been there. Your instrument. It used to be under the piano, still in the box with the damn ribbon on top. We never got to open the box up and find out what instrument you were supposed to play in the orchestra of life. But once you start to have a spiritual experience... Once you start to live in the world of the Spirit, it's an entirely different world. You can make it as complicated as you want to make it, or you can make it as simple as you want to make it. Today, I have a choice. It's the choice Chamberlain talked about. I can have, lead a self-centered life and suffer the consequences, or I can lead a God-centered life and suffer the consequences. It's a choice I always have. Spirit or intellect. Spirit or ego. There's two rooms, intellect and ego. In that room, I've got a 16-year-old running my life. I'm fairly smart. I can figure it out. I can tell you what to do. I can pass the test. But I have no power. In that room, I am conditioned to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And that mistake, I mean, my intellect, not bad. As soon as I start to get an emotional content over five, my intellect, my IQ goes down 50 points. So my emotions dominate my intellect. The only thing that orders my emotions is spirit. So if I'm going to find a... So we, we talk about these profound things in very simple ways. You're going you're gonna to live your life at the, pro, at the level of the problem or live your life at the level of the solution. That's profound. You're going to live one day at a time? You're going to do the next right thing. You're going to do what God would have you do. And Bill talks about the sixth and the seventh step. Humility, why is that so essential? Because when you have a lack of humility, what you have is ego. When you have a lack of humility, what you rely on is your intellect. Relying on your intellect and ego is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. It's helpful. It's insightful. You can have the words, but you do not have the power. You have to plug the lamp in, turn it on. That happens in the room where we're God-centered. Why? One of the reasons is in the room where I'm program-centered, I am not as important. It is not as important. There is rubber on the tire in that room. There is no rubber on the tire in the room with ego and intellect. That's circumstance-based. So the new guy or new gal, when you're talking to him, you come up and you make the mistake of saying, how are you? Okay. <laughs> What you, what you often get is the dump. Okay? It's the, it's, it's the word by word, blow by blow description of the fight with the wife or spouse. It's the word by word, blow by blow problem with the IRS, with work or whatever the hell's going on. In the God-centered room, that same person, a number of months later, when you ask them how they are, same circumstances. I'm okay. I blew it a little bit. I think I'm okay. I was a little nuts yesterday, but I think I'm back on track. It's an entirely different conversation. It has nothing to do with the particulars of the problem. It has to do with their response to the problem. It has to do with what they're supposed to be doing. It's a different world. It's just not a little different. 
It's totally different. So today, you know, I've gone broke once, one and a half times in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, <laughs> I've had periods of time where I've been nuts. I had a period for two days last week where I was in not very fit spiritual condition. It doesn't happen to me very often, and it doesn't happen to me very long. And what I have to do, and my temptation is to dive into it. My temptation, when I'm hooked, that's the only conversation I'm going to have. I'm literally obsessed with that conversation. It's painted on my eyeball. When it's painted on your eyeball, it's your reality. When you have a program and you're God-centered, it's here. You can go, oh, my God, I haven't been that nuts in a while. And then you can get in the God-centered room. Do you understand that you can enter that room in an instant? And that's our choice all the time. When you listen to us talk, most of us who are talkers, the, the issue is we keep bringing up... <laughs> To a significant extent, we're neurotics. And we keep talking about problems that we have resolved. But most of the problems we have are self-created. So we just cycle through the creating these illusionary problems, congratulating ourselves for resolving them. <laughs> I mean, it, re it really is a cycle. I mean, it really is like a gerbil on a track. And we just, and, and you can make, you can get so deeply into that process that you just would be shocked at uh, <laughs> my son calling from Geneva <laughs> with uh, 25 years of sobriety, 23 years of 23 years of sobriety. Uh, what I try to do today is not get into that internal dialogue. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous with an internal dialogue that needed me to drink a fifth of day to be okay. I don't know what was wrong with the guy. That, I was born on third base and congratulating myself for hitting a triple. If you can't make a living, if, if you can't make it from where I started out, you, <laughs> don't bother. I mean, I was given an education. I, I was just, you know, I had an easy time of life. And I made a hard going of it because I had this internal, I don't know why I had this internal dialogue. Most drunks in a room, you look at them and you, you know, if you talked about are you afraid of dying? No one's afraid of dying. What we're afraid of is living. We're more afraid of our greatness than we are of failure. It takes more courage to get the lid off your box and abandon your story the limiting aspects of your story, not your experience, the limiting aspects of your story, so that you can allow yourself to be present to who you are at your core. You're not going anywhere. Chamberlain sat me down in a room with 20 guys. Chamberlain would hold court. We'd have, we had him at Gopher State for the first five years, and we'd go up to his room about 10 o'clock at night, and we'd get out of there about 1 o'clock in the morning, I was sitting on the floor, and he said, Son, you're not going anyplace. You already are everything you're ever going to be. You're as good as you're ever going to He said, I can tell you're disappointed by that. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, Hell, I don't even understand it. I, it is. <laughs> he said, The man on the street committing rape is do, right now is doing, it was hard to listen to, is, the, is doing the best he knows how to do. When he has more light, he will do better. Before we were alcoholic, we were alcoholic. Once we identified our alcoholism, accepted it, surrendered to it, we started to be available to change that process through the grace of God in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We had more light. We saw it differently. You cannot alter your lives. If I had a magic wand, and said, I could take away every defect of character in this room on the condition we come back in this room in 10 years. Everybody. When we came back in 10 years, if your consciousness had not altered or improved or increased, you would have recreated the same problems in your life that you have today in this room. Anybody in this room have any new problems? We got new circumstances, but we have any new problems? Most of us don't. Most of us, same old, same old. 
and most of us have resigned ourselves, we're afraid of change. Scott Peck wrote a book, Road Less Traveled, later wrote a book, Further Along Road Less Traveled, in that book he's got a chapter on the, called The Road to Omaha, and he talks about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Five stages of death and dying, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Denial, maybe I don't have it, I'll go talk to, get a second opinion. Anger is why the hell is this happening to me. Bargaining is God take this away and I'll give my life over to you. And then they talk about the depression, not necessarily talking about the clinical depression, but the appropriate depression due to the circumstances that you're in. And then she says, but if you allow depression to do its work, which is to grind the ego to dust, you go through depression into acceptance. Now, most of us have had that experience in our collapse, in our entry into Alcoholics Anonymous. Then she says, most people who are dying do not go through the five stages. They go through denial, anger, and bargaining, but when they get to the depression, this pain's so great, they back up and go and, and recycle through denial, anger, and bargaining and never get through depression to acceptance. And interestingly enough, he says, this is the same process we go through in the major problems in our lives. Most of us are scared witless about change. I never understood how afraid I was to change. When I came into AA for the first six or seven years, I, with the issues and defects of character and problems I had, I tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed, and I still grew. But there comes a time where you change or you go. It's like the age of reasons. At that point in time, the path diverges. You either get deeper into the program and deepen your relationship with the steps and deepen your relationship with your God and increase your consciousness, or you build an addition onto your house to accommodate the problem. Chasers hang out with the chasers. Gamblers hang out with the gamblers. I won't call you on your crap. You don't call me on mine. Deal? Bad deal. Bad deal. Was it Peter talking about us being a flawed group? Uh, <laughs> we're the elite of the mentally ill. <laughs> you know. There was a great Zen master that talked, uh, in one of his sessions, he was talking about one of his dearest students. And I won't be able to quote this exactly, but what he said to his student, he says, I love you. You are the worst horse we have here. He said, you know, the best horse, before you ever even want to go left, the horse anticipates what you want him to do and he goes left. A good horse goes left when he sees the shadow of the whip. But he says, the worst horse, you have to take the whip to the bone before the horse goes left. But with the old-timers that we see in Alcoholics Anonymous, they've had the whip to the bone. It's not an intellectual process. They're surrendered. They were done. They were just flat-ass done. Today, the religion of the world of today is psychology. The second major issue I have in my life is what I bring to my AA program is my intellect and my psychology. It's worthless. It's helpful and nice to have insight. Don't get me wrong. I read a lot of books. I'm interested in this stuff. But this is a spiritual process. Intellect plays a minor role in the spiritual process. The knower, how do you find out what needs to be done? Peter, chop wood and carry water. Why is that the way to find out what needs to be done? Because that's the demonstration of your life. You want to know what to do? Look at what's not working. Look at what to attend to. That's the entry point. When Bill says pain is a touchstone of growth, it's the entry point. That's where we're supposed to show our spiritual attention. Our advantage is that we are so flawed. We are the worst horses. As a result of that, we need a practice. As a result of that practice, you have to do an inventory to know what to focus your attention on. Most of us settle far too early for far too little. We are not going to become perfect human beings. I'm not having this talk. I have, you know, I have eating issues. 
Uh, you can't tell that by looking at me, but I... <laughs> okay. I have significant unmanageabilities in my life. I'm not going to do a fifth step from the program, but I'm not without my problems and not without my issues. Uh, if I was giving myself a grade, I don't know what I'd give myself, a B plus. I'm in love with my wife. I have a good relationship with my children. I've retired and I'm self-supporting through my own contributions. A lot of luck in that process. I've damn near drove the bus off the cliff twice. And uh, the last week I got into an argument with my business partner and for two days I was nuts. So you still get hooked. But the fact is, is all I have to do is go to my spiritual room. All I have to do is ground myself. All I have to do is say a prayer. What if I really put my whole life in the game? What if I was really open to being what God would have me be? That's still, when I say those words, it's still scary to me. And it's scary to me because it's this trust idea. If I really, you know, you trust me, get in the wheelbarrow. You know, that one about, you know, they have that line across the Grand Canyon, you know. <laughs> you think I can, can do this? Yes, I think you can do it. Are you sure I can do it? Get in the wheelbarrow. What if I really got in the wheelbarrow? And I'll tell you, I'm an old, older guy now. So I've had this question about who God is in my life for a long time. And when my spiritual advisor, who died also three years ago, said to me, Bob, he said, you are God. I'll tell you, the first time I heard those words was not from him. The first time I heard them, I thought it was heretical. I just could not even listen to those words. But what if who I was at my deepest point was God? What if I really am a spiritual being? What if I really am a spiritual being having a human experience? You know, we talk about... I am so goddamn sick and tired of improving. What if we really are right now, just in our seats the way we are, the way we are supposed to be? And we're not all doing what we're supposed to be doing, but what if we are just the way we were created? Do you know any perfect human beings? Okay. But if we had a spiritual practice, if we were on a spiritual walk, if we opened ourselves up to that and relied less on knowing, knowing is the booby prize. Is there anybody in the room that couldn't pass the test, the knowing test? But we need an alteration in being. Until you see it differently, you cannot respond differently. And that is why we need a practice, and that is why we need our program, and that is why we need the text. There's nothing missing. There's nothing that needs to be added. For most of us, there's things that we need to discard. As Chamberlain talked about, you know, uncover, discover, discard. And in that... Your consciousness is open. Having had a spiritual awakening, what's the difference in life today? I'm more awake. I don't strike children. I don't spend money I don't have. I'm not as angry as I used to be in my life. That's an altar. Do I do that as a practice? No, it's happened to me as a result of my participation in Alcoholics Anonymous and of my participation in the steps. You're not, we're not going to be perfect. <laughs> We're not going to get rid of all our defects of character. The first two or three years in Alcoholics Anonymous, we sp spend our attention mostly on the consequences of our drinking. And we do an extraordinary job. Those are some of the most difficult circumstances and difficult issues that we deal with over a period of time, and it is just astounding to watch how people take those on with the grace of God, sponsorship, and the program. But the more subtle things that restrict us, when Katie talked about how many people are married, how many people are married, where I want, the things that restrict us from marriage, from permanent relationship, that restrict us from careers rather than jobs, that restrict us from the relationship. Most of us, in our, at our worst, we had to take hostages. We had to find people who would put up with our crap. We had a little click that, you know, and they were the people we could have the conversations with. As our lives start to broaden, 
you run into which do, what doesn't work. And all we need to do is put it on the table. Most of us take our defects of character and live them at the level of complaint. They are not a piece of business. And if we could elevate them from complaint to a piece of business, if we could allow ourselves to have them, if we could bring them into the healing powers of God and the healing powers of the program, and not be afraid that if I really open myself up to what God would have me do, there is no limit. And you will find, as whatever that great poet said, when you end the journey, that you will be where you started. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.